So uh, I'll pass over to you now, my guess. Thanks very much, Liam, and thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. Um, uh, I think my, my snappy title has explained things well enough, but um, in terms of what will happen for the next uh, half hour or so, I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about me um, and uh, how I ended up doing this kind of research um, and, and what it, how it works. Um, and then what I wanted to do was take uh, the audience through some of the sources that I've been, use, been using to research the history of pubs um, in a way that I hope will help other people do similar kinds of research. Um, and, and given why we're all here today around uh, Layers of London, get it listed on Layers. Um, <clears throat> so me, uh, and yes, I've been making silly faces throughout this whole process. Um, you only need to ask my team at MOLA. I now work at MOLA and I'm the head of audience engagement there. So I, um, I deal with uh, all the bits of our project work that face the public. Um, and uh, I think, um, you know, we've been really pleased to work with Layers. There's been a very, um, as well as these, the, these webinars, and there are quite a few from uh, MOLA folks coming out in the next few months. Um, some of our very clever technical bobs uh, have done a process which is called georectification, um, but which I think of as stitching and stretching of all the historic mapping uh, that um, underpins the, the layers platform. Um, and uh, we may even be able to persuade somebody to talk about that at some point. Um, but before I was at MOLA, I worked for uh, somewhere called Sir John Soane's Museum, which is an amazing quirky London museum, uh, which you should definitely meet, um, visit um, when it reopens in October. Um, I think it's going to be a bit more difficult post COVID to get in there, but it's um, absolutely worth a go. And he was an architect. Um, and so I spent a lot of time there thinking about grand public buildings and uh, big posh country houses um, and so on and so forth. And I was so interested in all this stuff that I went off and did a master's um, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which I really thought was going to be all about, you know, tasteful Scandinavian chairs and maybe some beautiful textiles. And I had a colleague there who wrote about collapsible top hats. Um, but I went and off and found near enough the ugliest thing I could in the museum collections, this bare, this bare jug that you can see in the middle of the slide. Um, it was made in Nottingham in the late 18th century. Um, and I uh, wound sorry, Magnus, we can't see your slides. Oh. Oh, we can just see you. Sorry. Oh, forgive me. Uh, How's that? All good. Yep. Cool. So ugly bear, um, and so this was a this was a, a drinking vessel used in pubs where or near where um, bear baiting was taking place. So I started thinking um, far more about uh, people coming together in less big posh buildings and uh, and having more fun. Um, and as a consequence of of doing that. Uh, MA and the research of which I'm going to share with you today. I ended up at MOLA and uh, broadly doing the job I'm doing now. Um, so, what was I good about pubs? Um, I think, you know, there's, there's so much interesting to talk about them. Um, and, and people do think and talk about pubs a lot and have been um, during COVID and before. So we often think, um, in England in particular about the loss of pubs um, and that's a, a common thread um, since the 1970s when, when, when use of pubs began to fall and change because of new kinds of leisure, um, television, etc. and also uh, deindustrialization and the, the, um, the relationship between the working man and the pub is one that, um, uh, that, that history makes much of um, and, and this sense of loss um, has engendered strategies for protection and that was one of the things that, um, that that really got me interested in this. So since 2011, historic pubs can be uh, listed as um, assets of community values or ACVs along with things like parks and libraries and that status protects them in the planning framework from uh, changes of use and conversion into, I don't know, Tesco metros for example. Um, and and I think pubs also have a role in framing national identity, certainly for England. Um, they get picked up a lot in, in political rhetoric 
Um, so, so indeed, on announcing the closure of, of England's pubs and, and as part of the COVID-19 lockdown on the 20th of March, the Prime Minister referred to removing, and I'm quoting now, the ancient inalienable right of freeborn people of the United Kingdom to go to the pub. Um, so there's this big sort of rhetorical um, question around access to the pubs. And we've seen a bit of that um, as pubs have gradually reopened in recent weeks. Um, and I've, I've included this um, uh, this cartoon from Martin Nelson in The Guardian here, um, where Boris Johnson, as the errant mother, is, is throwing the health secretary, Matt Hancock, um, onto the floor uh, whilst reopening the pubs, um, because it's a, it's a, a riff off um, one of a, a much older piece of satire, which um, uh, which has been used as source material for thinking about pubs and people drinking uh, for centuries now. Um, and that, of course, is Hogarth's Gin Lane. Um, and, and, and I think the point I'm making here is that a lot of the reason we know about, about pubs in the past and what they were like is because various people have worried about them. So this, um, uh, th this uh, image that you can see on the slide here, uh, Din Lane um, is uh, is about people drinking a particular type of drink, gin, um, and by association the places where they do it. Um, all these places marked with the gin, uh, the gin spirit measure that you can see here uh, are, are gin vaults or, or gin houses. Um, and so Hogarth has this drunken mother dropping the baby here, being irresponsible. I think it's really interesting for our um, further discussion that uh, she's also taking snuff, so she's got a snuff box in her hand um, and the emaciated fellow in the bottom right hand corner um, just pay close attention to the shape of the glass that you can see in his hand because that, that's going to come up again later. So who's drinking is really important and there's a question of, of different kinds of people, working people and the relationship between different classes here, um, what people are drinking, the, the companion piece to Gin Lane is another print called Beer Street um, in which Hogarth presents everybody as, as, as kind of civilised, cheerful and well-fed um, uh, and also in some cases um, people have even worried about how people drink so um, so particularly at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries um, a lot of commentators felt that drinking standing up largely by men next to a bar was associated with drinking more, and this was a bad thing because it led, it led to misbehaviour, um, whereas sitting down with your drink was a much more civil way to do it. Um, and I think the important thing um, with these sources, these people worrying about pubs, whether they're um, magistrates or satirists like Hogarth, um, is they're not always the people who are using them, but there is often a power relationship uh, you know, so a power relationship between a magistrate who has the job of regulating, uh, you know, and, and punishing criminal activity um, and a general population is a really important one here. Um, and I'm by no means the first person to look at pubs in a kind of academic fashion. Um, there's a really substantial body of, of studies on them. Um, and I've just included uh, cover images of two titles here, the Peter Clark's The English Ale House, which dates from 1983, um, and Paul Jennings, The Local of 2007. Um, there's more recent work, um, definitely a lot more recent published work than that, um, but I mentioned these because they've kind of underpinned the research I did. Um, and I think, uh, lest I give the impression that this is a, a kind of province of men writing about pubs, it's not. There are lots of women who also write about them. Um, and in fact, there's a whole international network bringing together all sorts of people. Um, academics who study drinking and drinking places called the Drinking Studies Network. I've got the link up there. I can also share that on the chat at the end um, and also you can follow them on Twitter. Um, but to return to those two publications there, uh, both are looking really at the pub over quite long spans of time, really long spans of time, in case of Peter Clark, he starts in 1200 and runs to 1830. Um, and they use what is referred to as a potpourri of source material, which I thought was a charming metaphor because I, I don't associate potpourri with the pub, but maybe Peter Clark who coined it did. Um, and this potpourri is composed of 
uh, sessions and borough records, central government papers, sermons and pamphlets, church court registers, fire insurance policies, um, and towards the end of the period, uh, the writing of artisans and the working men as it became possible for them to write. Um, and I've used many of these sources in, in, in the work that you're going to see in this presentation. Uh, Paul Jennings kind of follows that um, approach to source material. Um, but importantly, uh, particularly for my work, he also brings in a fuller consideration of the kind of architecture and, and interior design of pubs, um, which is really important because the, the spaces, um, you know, like, like that example with the bar spaces shape how people behave in them. Um, and just a kind of note on terminology here, um, both of these people identify the pub um, as a shortened form of the term public house. And that's a definitive type of drinking place, which is em emerging through the second half of the 18th century um, into the 19th. And my research looks specifically um, at a single example of, of one of these. Um, so I use the term uh, micro histories in the, uh, in the title and I thought I ought to address it here. Um, a micro history is um, is a study, an approach developed by academic historians from the mid 70s onwards, which looks at the past at the level of really small units like families, or in this case, businesses, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, and I wanted to attempt to sort of critique or, or to see what a micro history did in relation to the big survey narratives that I just mentioned on that last slide. Um, and the other thing that appealed to me about micro history um, is it maps really well onto urban archaeology methodologies, uh, like the ones that Moli use on sites um, uh, around London and have done for, for a sort of 40 odd years now. Um, uh, and so urban archaeology is principally concerned with this investigation and analysis of, of closely defined small sites. Um, and my research here owes a lot to the work of Moli colleagues who do that kind of work, uh, Jackie Pierce, who you can catch talking about pottery production in London on another layers webinar on the 23rd. Um, and also Nigel Jeffries, who I think we might be able to persuade, something, persuade to do something in August and watch this space. Um, and I wanted to think about uh, how we could um, understand establishments uh, like pubs by bringing together archaeological finds and documentary sources. Um, and the question I was trying to answer through the research was, uh, if in the present a community could legally declare a pub such a valuable asset it had to be retained how could we see maybe evidence of of communities valuing pubs in the past um, and and how did they experience them and use them so with nigel's help um, i was lucky enough to be able to identify a site um, the crown which is marked on the map you can see here um, dating to 1862 uh, where i could bring the full range of sources the documentary material ones that i've mentioned thus far um, to bear on trying to answer that, that kind of question. Um, and in London, we're really lucky. We're graced with a really rich record, um, including, as we know, uh, given, given uh, the organiser of this event, fantastic mapping. Um, we have the largest single archaeological archive in the world. Um, although I should say what's pictured here is actually a sham assemblage, which I, um, I made up out of uh, finds from the Thames Foreshore for the purposes of an exhibition. Uh, so, no, so no real artefacts were harmed in the making of it. Um, and in London here, we also have an incredibly broad range of business and legal records, much of which survive because actually London's been a, a really expensive place or a comparatively expensive place for a really long time. Um, so the Crown then operated from around 1780 until it was demolished in the early 20th century. Um, and the sources I've mentioned here uh, offered me an insight into various different periods of that history. Um, I'm going to take you through through a few different kinds of source material now um, and what I want to do is share a few thoughts on the kinds of things I think we can learn about what's going on in the pub from interpreting them um, and also what I've learned about how to access them through the research process. Uh, so objects, I'm, I'm kind of a bit preoccupied with objects so we should definitely start here. Um, the assemblage of artifacts that was uh, that related to the crown um, was excavated in 1973 by the Southern Lambeth Archaeological Excavation Committee. Um, and that was when the site was being redeveloped into the headquarters for the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. 
the primary objective of the investigation was actually a much earlier building on the site, um, a medieval gentry house, but the site team also excavated a brick drain filled with items, some 280 ceramic and glass fragments, uh, dated to around the mid 19th century. Um, and, and what I thought was really charming about this was these were actually analysed initially by a local schoolgirl as part of her A-level in archaeology. Um, so they've always been part of somebody learning how to do things. Um, and that, that schoolgirl's report is actually still held as part of the site's administrative archive um, at the London Archaeological Archive and Research Centre, which is our archive. And they're held under the site, site code L12973. Um, an assemblage like this is what archaeologists call a clearance deposit. Uh, so a feature in this case, the drain is filled rapidly in a single episode. Um, we see in these deposits a large number of relatively complete vessels, um, generally broken during or after the episode of deposition, so they're thrown away intact. Um, and this disposal of otherwise perfectly functional objects is the subject of a fair bit of academic discussion by archaeologists, mainly asking why people would do this, and what it then means for how we interpret them as evidence of activity on the site. Even within that, however, um, they offer us some really interesting insight into what might be happening at the Crown. Um, so finding a source like a clearance deposit without the help of a friendly archaeologist is not easy. Um, and there are only a very few that might necessarily relate to specific pubs. I've listed some possible sources on the slide um, where one might look for, for uh, listings of these. Um, and London archaeologist material, I think, is already listed on Notes of London. Um, so it's keyword searchable, I think. And post-medieval archaeology field studies and Lamas transactions are available online. Um, so they are Googleable. Um, so the assemblage from the crown contains a number of objects, such as the stoneware bottle fragment um, and the inscribed drinking glass on the left-hand side. Sorry for the image on the drinking glass. Um, uh, which allow us to relate it to specific proprietors of the crown, named people. Um, who are also represented in documentary records, which I'll come back to later. Uh, and that makes this assemblage particularly closely datable to a specific period when these objects would have been in use um, between the 1840s and the 1860s. Uh, and the use of these objects, um, so I'm thinking now of the inscribed ones, uh, for the storage and consumption of alcoholic drinks kind of fits with a, a historical preconception of the pub. Um, the novelty tobacco pipe here on the right hand side is uh, moulded in the image of Napoleon Bonaparte and, and hints at uh, the, the presence of politics and satire um, in the spaces of the, of the crown. Uh, objects such as the willow pattern uh, vegetable terrine and, uh, and ladle bowl, um, sorry, I've, I've scaled these really unhelpful, the ladle bowl is about the size of a tangerine, um, uh, suggest a sort of formal dining practice um, which is something we might not necessarily uh, expect or be able to fit into a historical imagining of, of, of what goes on in pubs. Um, and so in order to understand assemblages like this one further, <clears throat> uh, we use a method of, of dividing them um, into functional categories, and I've done that on the graph you can see on the screen. There is a big caveat here. We can't fully understand why these objects were disposed of um, although in this case we, do, we have good evidence to suggest they were in use within the building in a defined time period. Um, uh, and so we can use them to give a bit of an indication of the kinds of activities and maybe in there how prevalent they were based on the, on the percentage of any given type of uh, material. Although this is, this is, it's limited that I think. So we can see uh, on the graph of the crown, um, the most prevalent type of vessel is actually teaware. Um, and does this suggest that, that, that people were drinking more tea than they were anything else in the pub? Um, I don't know, I suspect not, um, but it does you know, reflect wider understandings of the time. Um, you know, the, the late 18th and 19th centuries were boom time for tea consumption, which increased sixfold over the 19th century. Um, and it's also interesting to think about the fact that Pubs like the Crown were always people's domestic spaces. Somebody lived there, the proprietor, um, often with a family, um, as well as commercial ones. Um, so we can begin to understand why that teaware figure might look like that. Um, the domestic dimension might also account, account for hygiene-related wares and perhaps some of the serving and dining wares. 
Um, although uh, in the case of the Crown, as we'll see later, there's um, good evidence suggests these were actually quite an important part of business. Um, and obviously the vital question with methods like this is what's missing from the assemblage. Uh, we almost see metal objects like the one pictured um, and metal holds a different kind of value. Uh, court records are full of people uh, nicking objects like this tankard, um, which again is it's possibly not very clear on the slide, but it's, uh, it's again marked with the name of a publican and a pub. In this case, it's uh, G. Kent at the Albion in Old Ford. Um, uh, and this one was actually excavated from a roadside ditch um, where it may have been dropped by a, uh, a thief on the run uh, or indeed uh, misplaced by someone who had had a bit too much to drink. Um, but that's the, uh, the story we can never quite resolve. So I've just added this one in uh, to show that things really do get everywhere. This is a fragment that I found on the Thames Foreshore of Deptford in 2016 um, whilst out with the Thames Discovery Programme. Um, and it has a partial inscription, which I've reconstructed on the right hand side. Um, it's a stoneware vessel uh, suitable for carrying liquids and, and may have had a spout of some kind. I did some documentary research based on the reconstructed um, inscription and found a publican, George Kerridge, um, uh, listed uh, operating a pub between 1842 and 1870. Uh, called the Wilton Arms, which still exists today in, in SW1 in Knightsbridge. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that this, this fragment has, has gotten so far, it's by six miles from uh, the Wilton Arms to Deptford. And again, in terms of the things, the questions we can never answer, quite how long it took to travel that six miles or where it might have been in between, um, always uh, leave me wondering. Um, and we're going to get a bit spreadsheety here uh, for a moment. So. Um, the name of licensees like that leads us logically into licensing uh, records, lots of which are held at the um, London Metropolitan Archives uh, and uh, local authority archives. So I was using Lambeth. Um, and these licensing records uh, list who the magistrates granted licenses to sell uh, alcoholic drinks to um, on an annual basis. Um, they're awarded at uh, uh, petty sessions, annual petty sessions, um, uh, meetings of the magistrates. Um, and, and so what we can see here is how long proprietors uh, stay um, operating an establishment like the Crown. So here we have um, Joseph Miller, who was one of the people who was identified by the uh, inscribed objects on the assemblage, and he's there um, from 1846 to 50. Um, and then there's a kind of rapid turnover of people operating the Crown. Um, and then we have William Aylett, um, who is proprietor for ages, 1852 uh, to 63. Um, and then another series of rapid turnovers. Um, but one of the people in that, Charles Keynes, is also uh, one of the people who, who's named on the inscribed objects. So um, they don't necessarily have to be the publican for a very long time. Uh, to be having these permanently inscribed objects made, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and then insurance policies offer uh, loads to, to us in understanding um, what's going on inside pubs. So um, these are from the, the, the Sun Insurance Company, um, are all held at the London Metropolitan Archives, um, and they're all held in a particular um, uh, fund there, which I've uh, which I've given you the reference for, um, and uh, they are really fascinating. Sorry about the grainy image, um, but they list various different categories of goods that people owned and were insuring, and there are lots of publicans uh, listed in the Sun Life records. Um, and so I was able to discover uh, that in the middle of the period that you can see on the screen here, um, where uh, John, uh, Susanna Pearson and John Powell are operating the pub, there was a really significant sort of £30 insurance value worth of musical instruments, um, which, uh, which were listed on the um, insurance registers uh, for the individuals. And so that might well be suggesting to us that there is some, kind of, some sort of musical uh, recital um, taking place in the pub um, during that period. Uh, we, again, we have to bear in mind the domestic um, angle to it. 
Uh, so it might be somebody playing music in the domestic spaces above the pub or something. Um, but again, it just it just offers us this opportunity to imagine um, the kinds of activities that are, are taking place. Um, <clears throat> court records are really essential. Um, and some people might be a bit surprised that I haven't already mentioned Old Bailey online, um, which is the, the records of the Old Bailey courts and they're all keyword searchable available online. Um, I'm sure many in the audience have counted them. Um, there weren't any cases in the in the Old Bailey records relating to the Crown, so I only ever used them incidentally, um, which is going to make more of a splash here, but they are an incredible resource. Um, lots of people writing about how, how we use them. Um, I was really lucky with the Crown that um, uh, that there had been a, a real humdinger of, of a dispute um, between uh, one of the heirs of um, some of the heirs of the um, proprietor when he died in 1830 um, and this uh, commission of partition document you can see how the the crown and other bits of property were divided up in these very zappy colors the orange the yellow and the blue um, between the different disputing uh, uh, parties in the in the court case um, and so we can find court records like that in the national archives there was a court of chancery case there um, there are also a great deal of court records in the LMA uh, and uh, local authority archives occasionally hold uh, court records or vestry records which can tell similar stories. Um, and we'll go on now, I'm racing slightly, uh, to newspapers. And uh, newspapers are a brilliant uh, source for, for kind of bringing what we've seen thus far to life. Um, and so uh, they can be quite hard work. Um, Bernie Online, which is accessible through the British Library, is a, um, uh, a, a collection of national, largely national newspapers dating back to the late 17th century, I believe, um, and they're available uh, at the British Library. Um, um, but there are also significant runs of uh, local newspapers that local authority archives often held on microfiche, which is not my favourite thing to work with. Some people quite like it. Um, and so in looking at that, uh, I, um, in looking at uh, newspapers, I found out loads about the Crown, which was, which did this kind of bringing to life process. Um, and, uh, um, so we have, uh, this advert here from old Joe Miller, Joseph Miller, who was one of the publicans mentioned in the earlier documents, uh, thanking the, uh, the push for his custom. Um, and the, the sort of familiar name here suggesting that he's a, a stalwart of that parish. Um, and also, um, I thought particularly interesting the reference to an ordinary daily at half past one. I looked this up um, and, uh, and an ordinary has been described elsewhere uh, by Charles Knight in 1842 as a dinner ready for all comers. So it's a bit like a buffet um, and a fixed charge. Um, uh, and that I, I sort of was thinking accounts for some of the, the, the kind of more refined dining ware um, that, that we were seeing like that ladle bowl and the vegetable terrine. Um, interestingly, in the same paper that that advert uh, is made, uh, is, is published in, um, there is also this reference to degrees of drunk drunkenness and the close of a parochial dinner. So that's the dinner attend attended by ratepayers, people who are, are paying um, property taxes in the parish um, and talking about this this kind of scene of drunkenness um, uh, where one uh, one one right pair falls to the first landing of the staircase and the second one rolls to the bottom um, and the, uh, the first one obso observes that uh, yes he is dead drunk but not as far gone as the one below I mean it's a silly joke and I think the uh, uh, the anecdotes there are put in just to fill up space on the page so it can get in the printing press. Um, but given that the Crown was actually situated next to Lambeth's Festery Hall, um, I did wonder if there was a bit of a dig, uh, a dig going on there at some of the some of the goings on um, in in the pub. Um, and we'll go on now to the big picture because uh, you many of you will have noticed. Um, that uh, I haven't shown you a picture of the crown yet, but this is it uh, with the Lambeth Vestry Hall next door. And um, the reason I saved this picture till the end is because it kind of reflects what happened in my research process. So uh, this picture was actually misattributed. It was listed as another pub 
um, and only by doing some detective works with those uh, plans I showed you earlier um, was I able to kind of make an argument that this was the crown. Um, uh, and so I'd done all this research, you know, the pub was demolished in the early 20th century, I'd never seen it. Um, and the, the, um, the kind of wahoo moment when, uh, when this turned up in the archive and I realised what it was, was one of the great joys um, of the research process. And uh, uh, I hope I've, I've given you, you guys a flavour of all that um, uh, and, and got people thinking. And I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Magnus. That was really interesting uh, and very impressive how you can connect up all the, the different bits of evidence, like the advertisement to the found objects, and that um, when you connect things, it makes a lot, it makes a lot of sense. So you wouldn't even think possible. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, feel free, everyone, to uh, put your questions in the chat, and I will uh, read them out. Magnus and hopefully you can answer some of them. Uh, just a question okay. in my mind was, I was wondering if you could, is there any like how to do micro history uh, guide or book or what the literatures? Yeah. Hmm. Um, the, I mean th there is uh, an awful lot. I think I think the the useful bit that certainly covers archaeology um, is uh, is all is all covered in the literatures of um, um, historical archaeologists, and the name for the methodology has gone right out of my head. Um, but let me look it up, and I will pop it on the chat. Um, there's a there's a lot of academic literature about it. I'm not aware of a uh, of a kind of simple how to guide. Um, uh, but, um, Sorry, I'm delving deep here. Okay. <laughs> um, but let's cover some other questions in the meantime, and maybe I'll I, I can find some links. Yeah. Robert was just wondering where did you uh, where did you find this picture of the crown in the end? Okay, so that's a good question. This there was a photocopy of it in the Lambeth Minette the, the Minette Library, the Lambeth uh, Borough Council Archive, um, and um, uh, and the photocopy was misattributed. It called the pub the mitre, but I'd seen the picture of the mitre in a different collection. It's in the b and um, Prints and Drawings collection. Um, the, 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 question, the question is called the Findlay Collection, and it seems to be, to be a collection of buildings looking largely at South, watercolours like this of buildings looking largely at South London. From the mid 19th century, um, the period a large structure in front of being built and the element assembly of these places that might be disappearing. Oh, you broke up a bit during that um, answer. Oh. Did you, did you say that again? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It's in a thing called the, um, it's, it's part of the VA Prints and Drawings Collection. Um, uh, and the collection, the specific bit is the Findlay Collection. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all pictures of old buildings in South London or older buildings around South London, so Lambeth and Southwark. Um, and I think the, the, the sort of collator of the Findlay collection and maybe the artist was worried that lots of these buildings would be demolished in the, in the big kind of reorganisations re and rebuildings that were going on at the time. Okay. Um, um... And did you come across any interesting uh, links with London breweries during your research? Um, in the case of the Crown, no. Um, it was it was associated with with one of them, um, the uh, Mew Brewery, M E U X, um, was um, held there. Uh, held about that in the Greenwich Archive actually held about that brewery. Um, I did encounter lots of brewery records in doing the kind of research around it. And because breweries have owned lots of pubs since the, um, probably since the mid 18th century onwards, um, th there are lots of these kinds of records about properties in, um, uh, in the brewery collections of May House. Uh, quite a few brewery collections. Yeah, I've, I've and Hamburg, and 
there's a screen that will like something that shows you that, that will give you information about uh, the, the kind of property, um, properties being sometimes plants and designs and sometimes inventories. Uh, inventory is an amazing thing which I probably didn't try now because they allow you to put objects into different, you can put objects into the kitchen or the barn of a park. Um, I think now, the question. I hope it does. <laughs> uh, Alistair asks uh, any tie in to the brewery vestry hall records or even any tithe or relevant census records? Uh, yes, certainly vestry hall records because it was next door. I was looking at them. Uh, they never refer um, to the, the crown directly. Um, uh, but they were quite interesting for context and to understand how uh, the part of Lambeth around it was changing when I was looking at what was going on um, inside. And then the other kind of records. And so to get more of a picture of that context, I did actually do a little exercise on census records immediately adjacent to the pub. So I basically took a look at of these properties around the corner here and these ones behind it and put them all together to say something about who was living nearby um, and it transpired there were lots of you know it was sort of what you'd expect um, for, for Lambeth because there's big pottery there there were lots of pottery workers um, and then later lots of um, lots of engineers because there was a big engineering works just to the uh, just to the east of the site. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, do, let me see. Uh, lots of people saying thank you. Uh, Some says, I have an ancestor who was an auctioneer in Newington and appears to have been active in, with leases of pubs. He often appears in adverts for London pubs and news, numerous newspapers. So that's more of a comment than a question, but thank you. Um, how many uh, comparative studies of pubs to your fantastic one are there? Well, I have to thank the questioner there for their um, uh, for their for their uh, comment. Um, I uh, sort of mic micro. Um, I'm I'm not aware of any and anyone trying to do this kind of um, um, micro history thing in quite the same way. Um, but some 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 people do look at um, defined areas. So there's a really good book by um, Paul Jennings again on uh, on all the pubs, uh, the kind of pubs and inns of Bradford in a defined period of time, um, and looking at how how they work across a town and particularly an industrial town uh, like Bradford is a really interesting approach too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, maybe and of course, as somebody else has just pointed out on the chat, there are there, there is more and more now the kind of Secret History of Our Streets um, uh, kind of documentary programmes focusing on individual properties in this way quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we have one more question. Um, Patrick says, thank you. As you we were talking, it occurred to me that a modified and simplified project like this could be useful in teaching my history students. I could provide some artifacts, records, and have my students try to recreate a history of a community building or institution. I was wondering if you had any ideas along that line or done some kind of related exercise for students or other non-expert groups. I haven't, but what Patrick is proposing sounds a bit like something called, uh, something that um, people at Historic England run called the Heritage Schools Programme, which is about integrating local heritage uh, and local heritage research into um, into schools level and that's there's more information about that available um on their website uh, thank you very much for that and i think unfortunately i'm sorry if anyone's question didn't get get gotten to but we're out of time uh thank you again magnus that was a really great presentation and thank you for answering all the questions you are most welcome and thanks everybody for joining yep uh, thanks, thanks for having me and we will have more webinars um over the coming weeks and months. Uh, so keep an eye on our social media and our mailing list to keep, uh, check that out and make sure you sign up in plenty of time because they're very popular. 
Uh, so have a nice afternoon, everyone, and a good weekend. All right. Ciao for now. Bye. Thanks. Mm-hmm.